Good evening, everyone. My name is Zachit, and I will be your moderator tonight. Dr. Wally Rene is our speaker tonight, and he will be helping us answer the question, 3D printed smiles, fact or fiction? If at any point you have a question, please type it into the box labeled, have a question, and we will conduct a live Q&A at the end of the webinar. To talk with other attendees, navigate to your control panel at the bottom of your screen and click the chat icon. This webinar is sponsored by Desktop Health. Henry Shine is not offering CE credit for viewing or attending this presentation live or on demand. Dr. Rene, welcome. Thanks, I uh, appreciate the introduction. I'm really excited to be here tonight um, to kind of dive down this rabbit hole of 3D printed smiles. And it's a little bit of a controversial topic and that's what the factor fictions for because uh, there's many individuals that don't really know much about 3D printing and whether or not you could indeed print definitive veneers and inlays, onlays, and restorations and smiles and things like that. So um, I'm going to go ahead and get started because we have kind of a little bit of, a little bit to cover here, but a little bit of background about myself is that um, I have a practice. So I'm a practicing clinician and I practice in Charleston, South Carolina. I also have a training center called the Mod Institute where I am the director of education. I also have a role at Desktop Health um, in the VP of Clinical Strategy, which means that I really get to help them develop new materials, new resins, and new applications. And so if you think about where we've come in digital dentistry, this is me. I'm the kind of, I guess, chubbier guy there um, with the eye scan uh, t-shirt. This is back in 2008. And back then, I was just a few years out of school and I understood that there was a scanner revolution coming where we were going to be eliminating physical impressions. And I wanted to jump on that and, and get started and really learn everything I could about intraoral scanning. And I was lucky enough to be a faculty member at a university where I was able to teach intraoral digital impressions to undergraduate dental students. And it was really cool. But it was difficult because the scanners back then were, I mean, to be honest, uh, difficult to use, especially for full, full mouth indications. Fast forward to, um, you know, this was taken in, in 2020. This, these are my colleagues um, that I was uh, working with at the university at the time. I'm, I'm no longer at the university. I, I left to start my own practice. But um, the scanning technology, look at the edentulous arches back there. On each one of those scanners, there's, you know, Medets, there's three shaped trioses, there's Iteros back there, um, Emerald S. It, there's a prime scan. It goes to show that, you know, in 2008, we were scanning single units and, and oftentimes struggling. Now we're scanning complete arch, complete arches, edentulous arches, uh, full arch implant cases. And it's really cool to be uh, a part of the profession that's pushing the limits of. Um, incorporating technology into medical dental practice, right? Um, our profession's leading the way. If you look at all other industries, uh, we should be proud of ourselves. We have pioneered 3D imaging, um, not only 3D radi radiographs with uh, cone beam CT and, and things like that, but 3D uh, metrology scanning as a profession. And look at this data of, of intraoral scanners um, compared to polyvinyl. Uh, this is a recent study that I did that uh, will be published soon. And we did it on a human cadaver uh, substrate. Um, but we have come so far with scanning and we predicted it. In fact, uh, if you look at market penetration of scanning, um, it's amazing to, to see that roughly 60% of dentists have intraoral scanners. That's incredible. 41% uh, have CBCTs, and 81% have practice, practice management software, of course. And then, you know, after the scanning revolution kind of came the milling revolution, where, um, you know, all the scanners, uh, we had to do something with those images, right? So they were sending to laboratories their intraoral digital impressions, and laboratories were designing digitally and milling. In fact, you really can't fabricate a zirconia restoration without it being milled. And so zirconia also helped um, kind of pioneer that, that milling revolution. 
And in fact, now, if you look at milling, it's such an accurate and nice um, technology. 90% of all fixed restorations in the United States are milled. And I'm, just not, I'm not talking about chairside mill. I'm talking about just milled in general. So, you know, um, we have about almost 20% market penetration of mills and practices, but most mills lie in laboratories. And I think the reason why is because it's, it's such an efficient and nice technology. But now we're kind of entering, I would say, I want to call it a new age. I would just say a different age of digital dentistry where, and they're not mutually exclusive. It's not like if you mill, you can't print, or if you print, you don't mill. It's just, it's just another tool that we have in our tool belt. And this is the 3D printing revolution. And it's really exciting to see this revolution occurring because it provides unique restorative options for our patients that we never thought we could provide. And that's what I'm going to hope to explain today. I am not saying that 3D printing is overtaking milling. What I'm saying is that 3D printing is in a category of itself that we haven't really defined well. Now, one thing that is really causing this revolution in 3D printing is material evolution. And just like on milling where zirconia, lithium disilicates, and, and other materials really pushed milling, um, now we have resins, new novel resins that are composed of new oligomers um, that have really solved a lot of the issues that we have with older 3D printed resins. You know, maybe you don't know, but one of the things that held back 3D printing from becoming mainstream was that things that we used used to print were pretty brittle. Um, they would they would snap if you just kind of pressed them with fingers. They were ugly. They soaked up a lot of stains. It kind of looked like they came out of a Cracker Jack box. If you look at some of the old dentures I used to make, totally guilty. Now, though, if you look at 3D printed resins, the latest generation of resins, and this is why I'm proud to be associated with Desktop Health because first and foremost, they're a resin company that's pushing the limits of resin chemistry. We could print absolutely gorgeous prosthetics that are durable. Um, even that go beyond temporary prosthetics. Take this all on X prosthesis here. Um, this is made out of Flexera. So the pink part was printed out of Flexera base and the teeth were printed out of material called Flexera Smile Ultra Plus. And we'll get into that in a minute. Uh, but look at the incisal edge characterization. This is applied using a technique called the scoop technique, which is a lingual cutback where uh, colors are applied internally, not externally, so they don't brush off. The technician that did this is one of my favorites. His name's Jack Murano from Absolute Dental. And he uses this material for a lot of his uh, dentures and, and provisional all on X prostheses. But we were never be, before able to achieve this type of aesthetic with a printed prosthetic. Um, even provisional crowns and chair side crowns, we could 3d print rapidly, um, restorations like this. And that's what I'm hoping to go through today is the prosthetic applications of 3d printing. Well, let's talk a little bit about kind of the technology that I'm, that I'm going to be mentioning. Desktop metal is a publicly traded company that, um, is leading the way in 3d printing and in industry. So they, they print things for like Ford and Boeing and. Um, other big manufacturers in the industrial space. They purchased Envision Tech, and Envision Tech was a dental laboratory 3D printer traditionally. They had um, the Envision Tech 1 and the D4K Pro, very successful in the lab world. Well, um, a spin off company, Desktop Health, was made, um, and that company represents all dental printers for desktop metal now. And Envision Tech basically invented DLP printing. They hold all the original patents on this technology. And what DLP printing is, is essentially a movie theater projector that is high intensity, 385 nanometer wavelength. And it's projected onto a, a mirror, which reflects the light up onto a tank. Think of it almost like a fish tank that is filled with, essentially, if you, if you kind of dumb it down, it's filled with flowable composite on steroids. It's a highly filled, um, newer chemistry of a, a flowable type of resin, right? So typically methacrylate-based resins that are composed of new oligomers 
And what this light does is it cures a layer 100 microns at a time, 50 microns at a time. It'd be like you doing the world's tiniest little composite layer by layer. Instead of you using two millimeter increments, you're, you're doing increments that are literally um, the thickness of a human hair, and you're curing it, right? And instead of using your blue intraoral curing light, you're using a projector. So that's kind of 3D printing in a nutshell. And the pers- it's not really different. So it's not really rocket science. You know, we've had this type of um, stuff in our patient's mouths forever. We just have been squirting it out of a, basically, we've been squirting it out of a compule and pressing it in with an instrument and shaping it to the best of our ability and curing it with a light that we have the ability to get in the patient's mouth. Well, what this technology does is it, it basically builds restorations using a light source from a digital design layer by layer. And the advantage of that is the contours are going to be perfectly designed by a digital technology and the, the material is going to be polymerized at a higher rate than a direct resin. So a direct resin, you're going to get anywhere from 60 to 75% degree of conversion of the methacrylate esters, whereas a printed restoration, you're going to get right around 80, 88 to, to 90 percent degree of conversion and that means it's going to be a stronger more durable product compared to a direct resin but this is kind of my lineup i have a printer called the einstein it's that white um kind of printer there they're about the size of i don't know like a toaster maybe uh, maybe a little bigger there's um, a curing unit that is that kind of thing all the way on the right with the the lid open and then there is in the middle that is the wash alcohol wash station this is my um, kind of practice. It's a classroom here. Um, I, you know, this is funny. That drone that we're flying right now actually crashed into that window uh, pretty hard right there and crashed the floor. But we, we work out of Charleston. We have a two, two operatory practice. It's mostly uh, all full mouth reconstructions and um, bigger implant cases. And it's attached to... Um, the training center, which has these printers in it. This is my printer lineup. I print probably a hundred items a week or more for my patients. Um, I've done over a hundred different veneers uh, most recently. So everybody always asks, what can I print? And I think that's a super good question. It should be more like, what can I not print? Because <laughs> these days you could pretty much print anything that you could uh, fathom. So my favorite application is by far veneers. And we'll go into that and I'll tell you why. Um, inlays and onlays, I love printing these uh, in quadrants. And it becomes efficient in that mode. Crowns, um, crowns are really good to print. Implant crowns especially are one of my favorites. And you can print dentures, partial dentures. Occlusal guards, awesome to print occlusal guards. I don't send out to labs anymore for any of that kind of stuff. Temporary bridges, provisional all on Xs. And people are pushing the limits with by making them permanent. I don't know for all on X. I don't know if I agree with that. For crowns, inlays, onlays, veneers, yeah, for sure. But uh, for, for those giant indications like that, maybe, like all on Xs. Clear liner bases, you could print and do positive pressure suck down. So there's design services that you could shoot your intraoral scans to. They'll design the aligner models, and then they send them to you, and you print them, and then you have your team members do suck downs on them and trim the, there's even robot arms that trim the aligner bases, but you could do a whole case for like three, 400 bucks all in on material cost and design fees. Um, direct aligners. That's something that we've been working on for the past four years. Um, we're kind of with FDA right now, but it's a resin that you could actually print the aligner versus doing a suck down. Those of you who don't know, everybody, including Invisalign and, um, you know, Ortho FX, every, basically everybody's doing uh, aligners on models, right? Printed models. And so you also could do indirect bonding trays, which are rubbery, where you could have your brackets um, pre-located in and you could do um, more precise bonding of your brackets. Of course, you could print models, surgical guides, shell crowns, and mock-ups, and we'll get in through some of that. But the majority of what... I use to print these kind of amazing things is a material, and, and this is kind of what really got me excited about printing, is a material called Flexera Smile Ultra Plus. Now, it is FDA class two clear for permanent. I hate, I put prom, permanent in quotations because nobody really knows what that means, right? I hate to use the word permanent. I don't use it with my patients ever. I use definitive or final. Um, and I, I just educate them. There's nothing permanent. Um, 
kind of like cars on a tire. Things get worn out. Even my ceramics, I don't guarantee. I don't put a warranty on these things. I don't put a warranty on my ceramics past uh, the same amount of time. So what is this resin? It's it's really, it's got the same chemistry that we've known and loved over the years of a highly reinforced composite resin material, but it has some new kind of tricks up its sleeve in that because it is cured not by a curing light in the mouth, it is cured by a machine, and particularly it is able to um, be cured in such small increments, we're able to get a higher degree of cross-linking of the polymer. And so we have this long chain chemistry, this new oligomer that we've developed that is able to cross-link at an alarming uh, rate compared to direct resins in the mouth. And so if you think of almost like a, a high quality denture tooth, um, those are highly cross-linked polymers. And, and the same thing is true with Flexera. And so this material, um, you can get about 950 restorations out of the bottle. It costs about, I don't know, 600 bucks. So that's like a rest. I mean, the restorations are going to cost you like under a dollar for sure. 50 cents to a dollar. It comes in all these different colors. Um, I wish I, I, I could tell you I use anything other than bleach, but I mainly use bleach and B1. That's my patient population, but it does come in all the colors of, of different A ranges and B ranges. And so what is this material uh, kind of indicated for use and cleared for? Um, that is, you know, a question that is super important. And we we tend to, as dentists, push the limits of what's possible. So I'm going to kind of uh, be totally transparent here. It is FDA class two cleared for definitive veneers, inlay, onlay crowns, implant crowns, denture teeth, and partial dentures. In other words, you could print um, like a flex partial denture with it. It doesn't, the material is not really flexible despite the name Flexera. Um, there is a counterpart material that is pink that's called Flexera Base. That material is a little flexible, but Flexera Smile is uh, filled with glass uh, filler particles, much like a uh, regular composite, and that makes it a lot more stiff. It is cleared for provisional bridges and off label use as an all and X indication, there's really not a, a material on the market that's actually cleared for all and X indication. Most of those are being used off label. And so let's get into printing smiles. I, I really do think that this is for me in my practice, been the coolest application of these. Um, and here's, here's why I love changing patients lives with veneers, ceramic veneers. I love it. I still offer it. In fact, that's probably my primary source of income is ceramic veneers. It's what I do best and it's what I love. But I can't tell you, probably 50% um, of my patients can't afford ceramic veneers. So I used to do, what do you think I used to do? Direct resin veneers. And I have to tell you, I have been dreaming about something that could replace direct resin veneers my entire career because I hate doing direct resin veneers. And so um, we'll go into to how printed could possibly replace direct resin. Here's a patient on tooth number 10 that has some funky crown. Um, no judgment there. It's, it looks like that maybe they tried to match the lower teeth instead of the upper teeth, which, which I, I mean, I could see that being a common problem if you're just quick to take a shade, right? Um, but the patient's unhappy with that restoration. And it's a, it's a veneer style preparation. But what I thought to do was Use digital technology. This patient has limited income, and I want to provide a service, and I want it to be fast and affordable uh, to her, but I also want it to be profitable to me. And 3D printing kind of fills that gap between a direct resin and a ceramic. So here we have tooth number seven being mirror imaged onto tooth number 10 using ExoCAD. Um, here we are 3D printing that, and that's kind of the way it comes out. And this is super zoomed in, right? This is um, showing this work at an intense um, blown up scale here. This is the way it looks immediately after cleaning the restoration off and trying it in the mouth. And I oftentimes use those little, that little raft there. Um, things often print with these rafts and these little tiny support tips hold the restoration up in the air. I like it as a handle. Um, 
So I tried it in like that, and that's you could see kind of the way it looked after I bonded it on and took off those little supports and polished it. And you could see, you know, is it perfect? Probably not perfect, but it is a phenomenal restoration, one that I would bet holding up a lot better than a direct resin. And to be honest, I think it's a, a really good way to kind of help patients who, for example, this patient just purchased this crown and the original dentist didn't want to replace it or something. I don't know what happened, but insurance had already been billed. She was upset. I was able to just bang this out in about an hour. And so all I did was cut off that old crown. I scanned it. That all took about 15, 20 minutes. When I say I scanned it, um, my dental assistant, Caroline, scanned it. She's a rock star. Sent it to the uh, design software that I have. It took about five minutes to design, probably. Um, 3D printed it in about 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes. And, you know, had a thing like that ready to bond in. And so I charge about $850 a unit for these. I am a little bit on the higher end of care. So a direct resin would be, um, a direct resin veneer would be probably around... 650, 700 in my practice, um, maybe a little bit more depending because it takes so much uh, longer for me to do a direct resin. Here's another patient. And this patient was um, really cool. She's, she actually, you know, I'm used to doing entire smiles and she's like, no, actually I love my, I love these two front teeth. And she's, and she pointed to tooth number nine and 10. She's like, I love these two front teeth. She's like, I hate how my smile doesn't match. And so she also complained of dark shadows in her buccal corridor. So I did no prep veneers on tooth number um, four, five, seven, eight, and 11 or 12, 13. So six veneers here. As you can see, I toggle these on and off. This is ExoCAD here. I am using a face scanner called the Vectra. It's a really cool scanner. Um, but so you can see a little bit closer up here, we have tooth number um, seven and eight. They're smaller, a perfect indication for a no prep veneer. So I printed these. Uh, premolar veneers and I printed um, these connected and I will actually separate through them with the saw after I uh, deliver them. I cheat in the delivery to be able to deliver them all kind of at the proper orientation. So this is what they look like after delivery and you can see we kind of pumped out her buccal corridor a little bit and we also were able to match perfect mirror images of 9 and 10 onto 7 and 8. So she's super pumped. The way that you bond these is you actually, it's really cool, you actually sandblast the intaglio surface, then rinse all that kind of aluminum oxide off, and then you paint adhesive on the inside and you blow that thin and you do not cure it. You kind of just let it stay a little bit wet like that. You're gonna etch the teeth, put bonding agent on the teeth, and then you're gonna use a veneer cement. I use um, Ivaclar's Verilink Aesthetic Light Cure LC. And you use a copious amount there and clean off the excess. And I did some characterization with the resin stains called Empress Direct here. So you could see um, no prep. The whole appointment took about two hours. So ROI on that is pretty good. Um, it cost me about $3 to print. And because I do my own design, it was $0 to design. So um, definitely cheaper even than squirting composite in the mouth. And, and it would probably take me hours to hand sculpt those composites and get them to look decent anyway. So here's another patient. Um, and this is really cool application. She has a worn dentition. I need to open the vertical dimension of occlusion. Uh, I found a stable joint position on her. Um, and what I did is I used the vertical dimension gauge that I also happened to 3D print. It's really cool. Um, let me show you. Kind of her story, you know, she's um, got seven millimeter long central incisors. She has pathological wear. We use these 3D printed uh, video gauges you can find on my website at themodinstitute.com. It helps determine the vertical dimension of the patient. We used a 3D printed Lucia jig that I designed in CAD software that has some retention elements to help hold the putty in. And what these jigs do is they basically help determine a, a stable joint position. Um, by removing contacts from the posterior teeth, you're able to kind of seat those condyles at a, at a stable and repeatable position. And then what I do is I scan the patient and I use the Emerald S scanner, but it doesn't matter what scanner you use. Um, they all work with the design software. Um, 
it's all open these days, right? So I designed, I used a 3D face scan as well on her. To help me mount, uh, I also did a CBCT export onto this articulator here, and I'm able to use Bergstrom's point to mount that. And then throw her into my favorite software here, which is uh, ExoCAD. And I go ahead and um, the version of ExoCAD I use is by PlanMac. It's called PlanCAD Premium. I think uh, Shine sells that to docs. So it's, it's really powerful. You can use the face. You could use all that information, all the new vertical dimension, the skull. You could use the all that information to basically change this person's life by creating a customized occlusion path for her, and then you could 3D print that. Here I am building an anterior guidance and I'm removing um, posterior interferences. Um, I'm not a nathologist by nature, but I do believe in um, protected occlusion um, at a stable joint position. So here I am working in that cuspid rise and posterior disclusion with anterior guidance. 3D printing these, these are all additive, right? Because we are we have a worn dentition case. And I'm able to 3D print the upper and the lower arch. And I'm able to do this in, in 18 minutes or so. What's really cool is I actually did this whole thing in a single visit. And then what I'm going to do is I bond them on the teeth. So I'm bonding them on her teeth and sending her home. And I'm letting her try out her new vertical dimension, her new uh, bites and her aesthetics and phonetics. And um, I'm able to verify if it's a stable joint position by looking at occlusion in a few weeks. And so that's just one application. And, you know, I have to be honest, in a case like this, if uh, this patient couldn't afford upper and lower arch uh, at the same time, I would put her in printed on the lower and um, final ceramics on the upper, and that buys patients time and allows me to do the case at the proper vertical with the proper occlusion. That's another way uh, 3D printing is really phenomenal. Here's another smile design case. This stuff is just all routine for, for me in my practice of printing these kind of uh, additive shells, um, characterizing them and bonding them on. Um, per, in, and I know some of you think, are they temporary or are they permanent or what? And well, it depends on the patient's finances. Um, sometimes they're trial smiles and they wear them home and they show family and they come back and get porcelain. And I charge uh, a good bit more for porcelain. Sometimes the patients uh, can't afford that. And I charge for, I bond them on permanently. And in that case, I charge between what a direct resin would be and what a ceramic is. Um, yeah, and so there's, there's a lot of uh, kind of fun that you could have with this type of material. Here's another patient. So this is going to be a, a clear liner case, but um, I wanted to show the patient what would be possible. It's kind of a canted maxilla. And so we brought them in the software and we went ahead and sculpted the smile in the software. I'm going to show you kind of really quick uh, how to do it. It's really not that hard. Um, I do it. My assistants do it. Everybody in my practice could do it, my, my partner as well. And so the whole design process takes maybe 10 minutes to do this. Um, prints in about 15 minutes. And so you could have a whole mock-up ready to go. Now, if you're like, I don't want to design, I just just have zero interest in it. Well, that's cool. You don't have to. You could send your intraoral scans to a design service. And the design service can do all this kind of stuff for you and fire it back to you um, for kind of a nominal fee. And then you could just hit print and then you have it ready to go. The, you probably couldn't do that same appointment. There are very few design services that will do a whole smile at the same appointment. Um, but you could just get the patient back after you do the scans. No big deal. But here's the process. I'm going to show you. It's really not hard. These are right from the intraoral scanner. And I start this um, smile creator. And what this allows me to do, this smile creator allows me to bring in the face of the patient. And I use a retracted um, patient view. And I'm able to include things like interpupillary line, lip line, midline. Um, every patient, I take a retracted shot and I take a um, also a smile shot. And here the software is asking me to pin the 3D model to the two-dimensional um, photo. And to kind of do that, you pick common spots. It's really not rocket science. You alter the kind of angulation of the model in three dimensions there, and you line everything up perfectly. It's really easy. And then what you do is you bring in the smile shot, and the software will align the um, attempt to automatically align that smile shot to everything because it's looking at the nose and the eyes and the chin and 
the ears and all that kind of stuff. And it's trying, and there it goes. It, it kind of aligned it um, as best as it could. And what I do is I usually oftentimes have to go back and refine it. And to do that, you just pick common points like that. Okay. And from there, what you're going to do is you're going to mark the lip line, the curvature of the lip. And this is what your laboratory would be hopefully doing uh, if you were to send them some scans and a photo and say, hey, do me a, a smile design, please, and I'll 3D print it on my machine. And, and like I said, they will send you the STL file. You hit print. It costs you like $2 in resin, maybe less. And then you could do that versus printing uh, a stone model or getting a wax up stone model back and making a putty and then doing a putty wash and then squirting bisacryl and then putting in the patient's mouth and then cleaning it up and um, having all that additional cost of putty and, and all the time it takes to do all that. Um, this is basically ready to go, a lot less cleanup as well. Um, and like I said, there's two ways that you can um, deliver these. You could permanently bond them on as individual units um, using the technique that I had described on that last patient, or you could spot etch them if you wanted them on temporary um, or use like temp on clear if you wanted them on like super temporary, like just for a few days. All right. So this is um, basically the design side of things. And some people hate design. I find that Dennis um, would love it if they just knew how easy it was. It's the easiest thing in the world to do to, to take control of your own design process, especially for stuff like this. This is low stress. Um, you're kind of just doing a little mock-up. It's like setting a denture, except it's like the cheat code. You just move the teeth where you want them. You can kind of grow the teeth, expand them. Um, it's incredible how far we've come in digital dentistry that we're able to do these things. Um, this is real time, this video. It's not sped up. So we're able to do these things um, super efficiently. And patients oftentimes like to be involved. And if you give patients ownership of their new smile design, they're less likely to complain about things later on. It's kind of like if you bought a car, but you didn't get to pick the color, you might like start to get upset when you had to wash, a, say, a black car um, every day. You might be like, oh, I wouldn't have picked this color. This is ridiculous, right? Well, same thing when you do a patient's smile. If you let them sit down with you while you do this. And, you know, this will take time for you not to get so nervous while you do it in front of them. Um, but for me, it's a, it's a group process. I have a consult room and I plop my laptop down, sit the patient down and we're talking. I could kind of do the second nature where I don't think about it, but I'm like, yeah, you know, while I'm doing this busy stuff right here. I'm usually chatting about family and things like that. But when I get to the kind of the aesthetic side of things, I'm asking for some feedback and Give or take, I'm applying that feedback as I see fit. And at the end, what you get is kind of a, a, a smile that's been kind of group done with you and the patient. Um, and that's, that's, I think, important because they really like that smile that they created with you versus sending it off to a lab and getting something back randomly that they had no input in. Um, you're not going to be able to really sell cases. And I hate to use the word sell because not selling cases you're trying to provide treatment for somebody that deserves it right and you just have to let them know what's possible okay so here i am uh talking to the patient and you know they, they mentioned that they thought the canines were a little bit too long and blah 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 so i bring on the smile and sure enough they they are a little bit too long those are smile lines from the software telling me proportions and so you know from this what we're going to do is we're going to 3d print this little kind of shell. Um, the software lets you export that. It goes right to the Einstein printer. I just hit print. It pops out. Now, the Einstein is one of the fastest printers on the market. In fact, I, I think it kind of is. Um, a lot of people say they're like the fastest printer. It doesn't matter. You know, fast is good when you're doing stuff like this and the patient's waiting in the chair. And so every little minute counts. This this probably printed in 17 minutes or so, this, this kind of um, mock-up. And so this is, yeah, actually 17 minutes. So those are the little shells that I 3D printed. This is kind of what they look like right out of the printer, um, kind of odd looking. You have to kind of know how to finish them. And that's something that I teach at my courses. Um, but here they are uh, bonded in um, so he could go show friends and family. Um, 
you know, you know, we could just go on and on. I could talk about, you know, the smile cases that I've done um, for too long and it kind of will probably bore everybody, but you know, here's another young lady. I didn't want to grind her teeth. She's not happy with her smile. I wanted to do something additive and conservative and reversible. So, I, you know, again, I put her in the software. Um, same thing as before, designed the smile, um, adapted the midline to the facial midline, and looked at my proportion gauge here. You have several different options for proportions within the golden proportion spectrum. You have also some newer philosophies and proportions that you could use, um, but you're able to, to create the smile. 3D print, these are now what's, what's really cool, and it's hard to tell from the image, is these are 200 micrometers thick. That's like two or three thicknesses of a human hair. Here we are with the um, I Watson gauge, and we can see we're at 0 0.2 here. It's incredible how thin you could print these, um, thinner than you could fathom, thinner than you could mill, for sure. And so we, you know, you just kind of um, are able to bond them on and see if the patient likes them. It's a really fun thing to be able to do. And if you're going to do a permanent 3D printed veneer, I like to add a little bit of um, surface characterization. Here I'm painting actually liquid flexera on the printed veneer. And I'm characterizing it with a resin material called um, Empress Direct. It's a beautiful material by Ivaclar. A little bit of white, um, you know, a little bit of grays, a little bit of blues. And you could create mamelon effects. There's also a technique called the scoop technique that I teach where you could create the colors from within and not paint it on the surface. But this is within kind of a flexera layer here. So it's going to be protected um, for a long time. I've had these in place for over a year and the colors have not come off. So it's really cool to see um, how awesome these things are holding up over time. And you cure it with the light, and then you put it in glycerin, and then you cure it in a ma machine called the Autoflash. It's really awesome. And so characterizing those is really fun. So now, another thing that I really like, if you're talking about definitive restorations, I really like the concept of definitive implant crowns. And I, I partnered with a company called True Abutment for all my abutments. And so True Abutment makes me that beautiful gold anodized custom abutment right there. And what's really cool is they send me the 3D print file. So I don't design anything. I don't do anything. I send them the scans. That's cool. I just uh, had to show that. I send them the scans. And what they do is they send me the abutment in the mail. It takes um, like, a, um, like a week. And then they also, before I even get that abutment in my hand, they also send me the STL file that I could print in my printer. Um, and it, and it all, all in cost is like $210 or something like that. I can't remember. It's, it's super cheap. So I get like a, a crown and an abutment, screw retained usually for me. And if you look at Pascal Monnier, he says the inclusion of composite resin for implants is a significantly increased dampening behavior of bite. This is because implants don't have a PDL. And so, you know, you do zirconia on, on an implant and patient pounds on it. There's nowhere that's going except right to the bone. Whereas if you do a composite crown, the composite's able to give, it's like a shock absorber on a car. Um, and so here's a case that I did. I just want to show you the workflow. You screw in your, you scan your soft tissue, you screw in your true abutment scan body. They have it for like every implant company and you do the bite. And then what they do is they design for you a custom abutment and a screw retained crown. They give you that back. You bond the printed crown onto the abutment and then you screw it in the patient's mouth. You bond that on before you get the patient in the chair. Super cool to do. Um, huge ROI for me for these. If you wanted to go super cheapy, you could do, instead of doing a custom abutment, you could do a tie base, um, a stock abut, like a tie base. They have some phenomenal tie bases these days that are really awesome with giant anti-rotation notches. I do this all the time. And I print final. I print, I love printing final implant grounds. It's, it's, I feel like it's more gentle on the implant and it's easier for me to do and it's it costs me nothing and True Abutment does everything for me so I don't have any design time. So I know what you guys are thinking. These things are all going to wear away and it's going to be a terrible uh, terrible scenario, right? And I would I would tend to have agreed with that line of thought. And looking at the way some of my composites, direct composites wear in the mouth, they look like Super Bowls in about a year. 
Um, and then I got a giant plunger cusp coming down. Well, it turns out that Flexera, we, we did a study with the University of Alabama because this was my primary concern of the material before I started using it routinely. And UAB under Nate Lawson um, did a sophisticated wear study on Flexera compared to other materials on the market using one of the best profilometers in the world. And what they found was Flexera was one of the most wear resistant materials on the market, even better than milled, uh, some milled materials. And that's kind of incredible for a printed material. And it's something that actually encouraged me to do these as definitive restorations in my practice and on myself. I have a crown on uh, tooth number 30 on myself um, that I got about a year ago and it's phenomenal. Um, take a look at this all on X prosthesis that was uh, six months in the mouth. You can see how well these uh, restorations are holding up all, over time. And yeah, they, they get kind of, you'll, you'll start to get like little tiny little wear facets on them, kind of like gold used to do. It's, it's you know, it's an adaptable material. Um, <laughs> I don't know what this, this is like a PFM done. This is a all, this is a FP1 PFM patients just doesn't have, some good stuff going on here. And she came to me very upset with the way things looked. No worries. All we did was 3D printer a brand new FP1 and tried it in at a new vertical, new aesthetics, and let that ride for uh, a few months at that, at that occlusion and at that vertical before we converted it to zirconia. Here's another case of an FP1, or sorry, this is FP3. This is, this is right out of the printer, and this is after uh, I added um, pink material called Annex Gum uh, from Annex USA. It's a beautiful pink composite material. I characterize the teeth the way that I always do. This is something that is borderline, in my mind, a final restoration, but um, I'm still going to convert this patient to zirconia. But I know docs that are using it. We have 10,000 Flexera all on X prostheses out there. And we have about a 2% failure rate, which is as good as, as, good as milled. Um, um, here it is in the mouth. So, I mean, this stuff is super cool. Now, um, the last thing I'm going to talk about is kind of, you know, bread and butter stuff, like permanent crowns and inlays and onlays. This is, this is where people start to get upset. I am not trying to say that you should do this in lieu of milling. But let's be honest, only 14% of dentists have a mill. And there's a lot of dentists that can't, for whatever reason, don't want to uh, buy a mill. I love milling. I have a mill. Uh, and I love milling. But if you don't have a mill and you're not going to buy a mill because it's whatever, too expensive, and you just don't want to mess with it, you can get a printer for a, a tenth of the cost or, or, or maybe even uh, more inexpensive than that compared to a mill, and you could print these highly sophisticated polymers. And that's what a lot of people are starting to do. And, and what happens is the milling folks start to chime in and make fun of these people and say, why don't you just mill it? Why aren't you just milling it? Well, probably because those docs, number one, don't have a mill. And number two, they're trying to do something different. So let me explain. I hate doing direct resins. I really do. Um, direct resin veneers, for sure. But even large posterior resins, I pretty much would rather do almost anything else. And so... For me, 3D printing these giant composites saves me stress and time um, because a lot of it's delegatable. And so let me under, let me tell you why. So take a tooth like this, you know, a giant uh, occlusal there with on that tooth number 30 with, you know, leaking margins and decay. Clean it all out. I did a quick little uh, core buildup or here and then. Prepped it down, right? This is, happens to be a crown, like a crown, kind of an overlay, conservative crown, enamel margins. Then you leave. The dentist should leave the room at this point. The assistant will scan, design, and print a restoration. Okay, this restoration took about 15 minutes to print. You could print them even faster. If I didn't have those tall supports, I could probably print it in 10 minutes. Now, let me be clear, after it prints, you have to wash it in alcohol for five minutes, and then you have to cure it in the special curing oven for about 10 minutes, okay? So they'll all, but this is not doctor time. You are in another op doing dentistry. 
This stuff is being manufactured by your team. And I hope you understand that this is not supposed to be doctor driven here. Patient gets this restoration tried in. And um, this is me. This is my tooth. Um, I'm the patient here. Dr. Menino is the dentist. Um, he's a doc in my uh, local town. He's a phenomenal digital dentist. But the assistant tries it in and then sandblasts the restoration, puts the adhesive on the restoration. And this is the data on how well these things bond. Uh, you're going to get over, you're going to get over 35 megapascals of uh, bond strength to the flexera material um, if you use sandblasting with like a silane and an adhesive. If you just want to sandblast and use an adhesive, you'll be just above 30. And so there it is kind of bonded in. And you might say, well, you know, why not just do a regular crown? Why not? You definitely could. Um, this is this is just kind of like I said at the beginning of the lecture, a new kind of paradigm in, in digital dentistry. And this I grind like crazy. And this thing was done about a year ago or so. And um, it'll be a year actually in October. So less than a year. Um, partial coverage makes a little bit more sense. This is the last thing I'm going to leave you with before we open it up to Q&A. And it makes the most sense with um, quadrants. So let me explain why. When, when you design one onlay or inlay and you send it to the printer, it takes 15 minutes to print. Well, it also only takes 15 minutes to print 20 restorations. This is why for smiles, it makes so much sense. You could print one veneer in 15 minutes, or you could print 10 veneers in 15 minutes, because the way printing works, it's all by height. And if all the veneers are roughly the same height, you could fill up that whole entire printer with restorations. It doesn't take longer. But here's a partial coverage restoration here that we're printing in seven minutes. And we printed a few just for giggles. We I, they're literally 25 cents each to print. And I did a little bit of um, polishing and, and sandblasted it and got it ready for delivery. And I'm using warmed composite to deliver it. I, I actually just did that because um, I was trying something new. I usually use um, Ivoclar's Variolink Aesthetic Cement. Take a couple photos to see what this thing looks like. So there it is, a giant amalgam removed and turned into a printed onlay. Um, and like I said, it makes the most sense when you're doing two, three, or four of these things back to back because you'll get your perfect proximal contact, you'll get your perfect contours, and it, it costs you no more in time. And so uh, with that said, I'm going to stop here because I really want to have a time to open it up to you guys for uh, questions. Okay, so far we only have one lecture. It says, is this rec lecture recorded? Um, I think the lecture definitely is recorded and will be available um, later. Do you guys have any other questions? I really would love to, to, to answer anybody's uh, questions about 3D printing, restorations, veneers, inlays, onlays, crowns. Like, don't be shy. I want to know about dentures. <laughs> Oh my gosh. I do have, so there is a webinar um, that I have that is on dentures that's free uh, on my website. You could go to themodinstitute.com and go to digital resources and there's a free whole webinar on dentures. Um, can you use any scanner? Yes. You could use any scanner on the market. Uh, every scanner exports an STL. Now, if you're a CEREC user, if you're designing on your CEREC, you can't export the STL of your design. So that's a little frustrating. I kind of lock that down. Um, but you, you can use any scanner to, to design with on, on most softwares. What's the difference between this 3D printer and... This 3D printer is fast and it uses heat and something called closed loop technology. And it's also currently the only printer on the market that prints that Flexera material that I that I think is a game changer. And so that's the next question. Is this material printer specific? Um, yes, this material, Flexera Smile Ultra Plus is only currently FDA cleared on that Einstein printer. Um, that is one of, the, one of the things that I think is important to understand. Characterizing and tinting. Um, okay, Chris, so characterizing these things is really easy. Um, what you do is you take the actual... 3D printed resin. And so like I said, um, think of it like flowable composite. And you 
squirt a little bit of that 3D print liquid resin onto like a glass slab. And what I do is I mix colors into that based off of what tint I want. So Ivoclar has all the colors. Ivoclar has brown, blue, um, gray, white, yellow. And you put a little bit on the slab and then you mix it with that liquid print material and then you paint it on the restoration and you cure it with the um with the light and it sets up and it kind of makes the color from within because you're kind of mixing it with that same exact material you printed with um, and i also cure those after i cure them with the handheld light i cure them in glycerin um, to remove the oxygen inhibited layer in the in the cure box that comes with the printer the printers come with a cure box so that it can cure the materials we are a CEREC office. How hard is it to be efficient at learning new softwares? Well, so you could get CEREC InLab, and CEREC InLab will let you use the same exact software and export those files to, to any printer. Um, but if you want to learn ExoCAD, it is easy to learn um, ExoCAD. There's a lot of really good education out there on it as well. My institute is the, somebody said, tell us more about the institute. My mod institute is in Charleston, South Carolina. We have a website, themodinstitute.com. We do about 35 classes a year. And our most popular class is 3D printing A to Z, where people come and touch the printer and touch all the resins and learn about what you could do uh, with the printers. Um, let's see. Anything else here? If you bond the veneers permanently, what do you do afterwards? to prep for porcelain. Well, it's really cool because I actually will use the bonded printed veneers as a, as a depth gauge. So I'll do my depth cuts right through them. So I know, uh, be very conservative on my preps. For example, if you're lengthening and you're, you're kind of uh, doing all these recontouring with your printed veneers. And so they cut, they cut, um, they're not the easiest things in the world to cut off. Surprisingly, um, they don't cut like butter, like composite cuts like butter. They're harder than composite, um, but they're not as hard as like an Emacs. You cut an Emacs veneer off, you want to cry afterwards um, because they're very hard to do. Um, but they're somewhere in between. So it's kind of a good blend for me. Is it approved in Canada? I th I want to say it's like going to be this summer sometime approved in Canada, or maybe it already is. I'm really bad at that. I wish I knew. Um, I know the Einstein is starting to, to come out in Canada now, so I would assume Flexera is going to be as well. If an office has no technology, what's a good place to start? Limited budget. Well, 3D printing is, is the way to start, right? Because the printers are very, relatively inexpensive compared to mills. Um, you could For software, you could get the software that you could only purchase the part that you want to start with. So it could be very inexpensive to get ExoCAD, PlanCAD Premium, and just um, start with a crown module or, or something like that. And then you could build up so it's more expensive. Um, but that's a really good question. Okay, somebody said, what about printers that can layer different shades, Denton than enamel? Yes, yeah, so those types of printers usually are jet deposition printers. We haven't had those um, in dental yet um that could do final restorations like that there's some printers out there that are um fifty thousand dollars to three hundred thousand dollars that will layer different colors of resins but unfortunately those resins haven't been cleared for like final prosthetics um i see that as the future where you could layer colors intrinsically as you're printing it um, not quite there yet. That's probably definitely coming out in the dental office in the future, probably five years out from that. Um, but the material is already so intrinsically beautiful that when you when you bond a veneer on it, it's, it's kind of the natural tooth color shines through on the cervical. So it has like a little bit more chroma down there. And then the incisal edge is more trans, translucent already. So it's just already just a really pretty material. So how is the occlusal accuracy on the on the coverage? That's a good question because you're you're printing, and I wish I had a video that demonstrated this, because you're printing with the occlusal surface um, on those little spikes, right? Well, those those peel off like Velcro. They they literally just you just pop those off, and the little bumps that are left are like goosebumps. They're like tiny little bumps that actually I use a felt. Uh, felt finishing disc by by Comet, and it bumps those off without messing with your occlusion that you designed so carefully in your prosthetic. 
Um, that is a really good question because when I first saw that, I thought, oh man, this is going to ruin everything with all these little supports poking out. I t somebody said, Itero doesn't allow design. Well, there's tons of other design softwares that you could use with the Itero because um, the Itero allows open export. Um, Itero actually is um, one of the parent companies of Exocad. So what they've developed is a bridge where and this works with PlanCAD Premium as well, which, which is um, PlanMecca supported ExoCAD. It, it, it created a bridge where you could basically automatically send your iTero scans right to, right to the software for, for design. It's kind of um, really cool. Somebody said, my favorite software, definitely ExoCAD. Um, all of them are great. Three Shapes great. Um, Blender for Dental is great. But PlanMecca is the kind of the company that I, I work with the most, and they have a version of ExoCAD that I love. Somebody said, I would like to know the, your exact machines. Um, I have the Einstein printer for uh, my practice, and I, I have the um, Emerald S scanner for my intraoral scanner. But there's, like I said, there's a lot of really good digital um, stuff on the market that you should explore. A design center, uh, full contour is probably the design center that I would recommend. If you have no interest in design, zero, um, send them to full contour. Um, they will design these things for super cheap and they're, they're really good and they'll fire it right back to you and you just put it right in your printer so you can manufacture these cool things. Are you using ExoCAD for all design? Yes, I am. How do you calibrate printers for different resins? Well, the printer software comes calibrated, but if it should it get out of calibration, um, it's really easy in the software. There's a thing, there's a, a little drop down menu that says calibrate printer and it prints a L block. It looks like the letter L. And the printer comes with calipers and you cali you measure the um, you measure the L block and you enter it into the printer and it automatically calibrates it for that resin. If you're trying to develop your own resin profiles, that's that's a little bit different of a story. That's more of an all night conversation. What resins do you prefer for all indications? So Flexera Smile Ultra Plus for crowns, veneers, inlays, onlays, and Flexera Base for denture-based materials. Um, I like Key Splint Soft for bite guards. Um, we have a new Smile Guard material coming out soon. I think that's going to be awesome for that as well. That's, you guys are awesome. I love these. Any issues with fracturing when printing at 200 microns? There are some studies that show that um, higher micron, so for those of you who don't know, the default is typically 100 micron layers. So um, you could go really fast and print at like 200 microns. And what that does is it leads more lines in the material. There's some studies that show that it really doesn't matter as it really impacts material strength. What's more important is orientation on the build platform. So... And, and where, the, where the forces are. So if you print like an all in X prosthetic and you're printing it horizontal on the build platform, that's the strongest. If you printed it vertical where it was standing up, that's the weakest orientation um, because of the way the forces are in the mouth are, are down on that prosthesis. And so you want those layer lines like beams, uh, beams of wood on a deck. You want them flat. Um, that's a good question. When you bond them in one piece, what's the procedure to separate them? Somebody said, okay, that's a really good observance. Somebody said, uh, so I do my veneers um, where I cheat code. I have all 10 of them, and I bond them all in at one time using that kind of cheat code where it's all connected to that raft down there. And it saves me hours on delivery. I don't know. I, I used to get so nervous where I was afraid I was going to deliver one crooked and all this kind of stuff, and I would deliver two, and then I would clean, and then I would try the other ones on, and they wouldn't fit anymore, and then I would grind them, and I would seat them. Anyway, it took me like all day to deliver veneers. Uh, I got better over time, of course, but it's still stressful. With this cheat code, what you have to understand, though, is you need, when you design these in the software and you print them, you want to print them with really tiny connectors where you don't have a giant thing to saw through. And so what you do is you bond them on, you clean up all the resin that you can, uh, you remove those little support spikes, and then you use interproximal saws. I use one from Brassler. 
It's like a little white handled one with little teeth on the end. It doesn't shave on the sides at all. It's only end cutting and you just go right through. It's kind of hard to do, to be honest. Um, it, it takes probably a minute on each tooth to kind of saw through it. And then I take floss and then I clean it all up. <sighs> that was a really uh, good question, guys. I am so excited um, that we had had this time to kind of talk about printing and, and what all is possible with in-office prosthetics. And uh, hopefully we get to do another one of these, maybe for dentures, because a lot of you guys are having uh, questions for dentures. But we are all out of time. Uh, I got nine o'clock on my, I don't want to be disrespectful for y'all's time. Um, I appreciate everybody um, hanging on this long and the phenomenal questions that you guys ask. So, so thanks so much. Thank you again, Dr. Rene, for the great presentation. If anyone has any outstanding questions, please email us at webinars at henryshine.com. As a thank you for attending, everyone will receive a recording of tonight via email in the next week. Thank you all for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you again in our future webinars. Thank you again, doctor. Thank you.